Okay, we're back with Think Tech. We're back with Trump Week. And uh, Tim Apicello, I'm going to tell you that last night I saw one of four episodes in something called The Spy on Netflix uh, with Sasha Baron Cohen as the actor and producer. Real serious in this piece. The story of a Syrian espionage, espionage in Syria by the Israelis in the year 1965. You've got to see this. It's very good and very instructive about what was going on. It's yeah. a, a window into the Middle East, which everyone says, and it's true, is complicated. Well, Assad's father was very much uh, the power broker of Syria and had a pretty uh, brutal reign uh, during his time. Yeah, I don't yeah. know how Assad stays in office, except for the Russians. They, well, they keep him in office. <laughs> They Without just, them, he they just gained a third more of their real estate, you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, by the way, Jay, thank you for having me on. All right, good, Tim. Good yeah. to be here. Okay. Hey, since we're talking about Syria, if, we, if I may, um, I don't know if you saw the visual, the video of um, our retreating U.S. forces. I saw the rotten tomatoes. And the rotten fruit, potatoes, tomatoes um, being thrown at our troops. Yeah. What a, what, a, what a visual moment for all of us to witness as Americans. It's like, uh, it's like <coughs> the guys climbing up the ladder to the helicopter off the um, embassy in Saigon. Yep. It's just as gross. It's a, a piece of American history reflecting mistake after mistake. And, and Trump is the one who made these horrendous mistakes, and here we are. You know, I, I'll just, you couldn't have said it any better. It was just like the, them pushing the helicopters off or on top of that roof uh, back in 1973 uh, when we were just exiting as fast as we can from South Vietnam. It was, it, this one will burn and sear its position in my memory until the day I die. Although there's no graphics about it, they also... Uh, the, I guess it was the Russians um, or the Turks, somebody bombed our airfields, bombed our bases, bombed our weapons that we left behind. Yeah. Uh, it was uh, humiliating. You know, in 1992, I spent about a month and a half in Turkey, and I was in the region where there was a lot of Kurds. Mm -hmm. And I broke bread with them. I had many opportunities to have tea with them. For hours and hours, we would discuss, you know, um, United States, their life, um, fascinating discussions. And one was a dinner. And what struck me about the Kurds was their love for the United States, the principles of freedom, the principles that um, the United States was such a powerful force for good, for freedom and, and good in this world, the, to keep at bay dictators and, and genocide. And I'll never forget those conversations. And now I put that in juxtaposition to um, how we've stabbed them in the back, we've betrayed them, we've opened up our flanks. And, you know, this is hard for me to reconcile because they did have such trust in the United States. Well, they, they sacrificed 11,000 of their people to fight with us, for us, at our side. Um, it, it was a, um, an incredible investment, an incredible commitment on their part over decades. Really, really sad. Yeah, it is sad. And, you know, I think about Donald Trump and his recent quotes here, what I'd like to share, um, and, and put that in context to their faith and trust in the United States and, you know, what the United States stands for. And certainly, if you're in the military, how you feel about this, whether you're a former, you know, a, a veteran that used to serve or you're currently serving the United States military, it's got to be tough. It's you like be to really think tough. you're saving somebody, helping somebody. Then you find your president pulls the rug out on the somebody, and then and the somebody throwing tomatoes and potatoes at you. Yeah. And never to forget. Never to forget. And never to forget. And the world never to forget. We are a laughing stock yet still again. But what did Trump say about that? Well, he just recently just said that, um, you know, first off, our troops now are there to secure the oil. It's a small number of troops. Um, but the one that gets me is that we never agreed to protect the Kurds for the rest of their lives. That's one quote. And then there was, um, is there a written uh, agreement that we stay in the Middle East for the rest of civilization? So I understand the quotation. I understand the concept that, yeah, the United States never intended to be in the Middle East forever. It was all about oil back in the day, and it's probably not so much today. But here's the deal. There's a difference between um, a well-thought-out strategy of exit versus a snap decision over one telephone call with no consultation with anyone and exposing their flanks to an immediate attack from Turkey. You see, what I'm getting at is this, this, uh, the difference between what Trump thinks is his validation and rationalization for exposing the, the Kurds for annihilation versus what should have been the case on how we do gracefully exit with honor. I'm not sure we should have exited at all. 
Uh, I, don't, I don't think we agreed to spend a thousand years there, but I think our, our moral issue, our moral mission um, is to make the world safe. And we were holding together a delicate, uh, a delicate, uh, tense, controversial um, confluence of countries all looking for the wrong reasons to o occupy land there. And our presence sort of held it together somehow. Um, and our departure pulled the rug out from under it. It really did. So is it worth it to stay there? You bet it is. It's worth it to be, you know, the greatest nation on earth. It's worth it to, um, you know, provide our moral leadership, our moral authority. That's what we've gotten along on since World War II. And now to say we're a bunch of jerks and we don't break our, we break our promises, we don't stay around, but we don't care what happens to them even though they're our best buddies in the area, um, is really remarkable, and it teaches the world a lesson. We have lost moral leadership, lost it. Yeah. And, you know, everybody says, oh, yeah, we'll get it back again. Democratic candidates, yeah, we'll get it back again. I'm not so sure it's something that you can just get back again. I think it may take decades, if at all. Those visions, History those, moves forward. We are yeah. never going to be where we were. Those visuals of those videos of them throwing and pelting our U.S. vehicles those are images that will not just go away. They'll be there. They're a part of history and the record of history. Yeah. Um, you know, by the way, just for the record, there were kill Kurds killed in this incursion from the Turks. Yes. There's families, there's fighters. Um, they were killed. We yes. don't have a full body count, but believe me, there are people who died during this. We don't, we don't know what's going on. Our troops are essentially out of there and into Iraq, protecting the oil. Um, Iraq, who doesn't want us in Iraq. Correct. And I thought the whole thing is extraordinary. What's, what's happening is he's lying a mile a minute on what it means and, and what he's doing. And, you, you know, I mean, unless you don't do critical thinking or thinking at all, ultimately, these days, you have to realize that he's lying to us about what's going on, about its meaning and effect and his plan. There is no plan. And so and this is going to get worse before it gets better. And by that, I mean uh, Assad is going to continue to beat up on the Syrians. Uh, the Turks are going to continue to beat up on the Kurds. And the Russians are going to get greater hegemony uh, in the whole area. Um, bottom line is we are out of the play, off the field, and we look like idiots. Yep. And with all our big fancy military, um, you know, with all our money, with all our technology and weapons, we're, we're idiots. Yeah, we've been outfoxed and outplayed by Turkey and Syria. How about that? I don't know if we'll ever recover from this. You know, did we ever? Joe recover Biden from said, "You know, Turkey of all people, Turkey. We've been outplayed by Turkey." Oh well, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, yeah. Um, you know, here's here's the bottom bottom line: is was this just a spur of the moment idea that came across Trump's brain, or was this a strategy of um, distraction from the impeachment inquiry? One never knows. Or was it one of those many many roads that lead to Russia? Because the winner in this deal is clearly always Russia. Russia. Yeah, always, always Russia. Russia. And that is a common denominator for Ukraine, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I mean, when she says all roads lead to you know, Russia, she, she's including Ukraine, of course. Yes. And uh, was it yesterday or today? There was an article this morning in the Washington Post about how while Trump has said that he was out there fighting corruption in Ukraine, Big point on the agenda, and that's why he made that call, or those eight calls, as it were. Um, in fact, around the same time, uh, he defunded eight billion dollars of American of American <laughs> aid, which was intended to help the Ukrainians fight corruption. corruption. Eight billion, not three hundred ninety-one million, but eight billion. <laughs> So how, you know, genuine could he be? How sincere could he be about fighting corruption if he took all that money off the table without explaining it? Now his big song and dance is that he's, you know, committed to fighting corruption. But $8 billion, yeah. incredible. Last comment on Syria. I don't care what political affiliation you choose. I don't care, Republican, Independent, Democrat. This is a shameful, shameful point for all of us. And I don't care well, who your allegiance is to, um, no one likes this. Well, the base does, because the base believes How can in they him. like that, Jay? As I was saying, as they buy whatever he says, and he comes up with these lies to cover his, his tracks and his mistakes and his gross errors, um, and they believe him. And that's because he's got them in this kind of thing 
uh, where they don't think they accept him as almost a religion, as a cult personality. Well, then they have to buy his argument that it's okay for us to pull the, you know, the stab the Kurds in the back because they didn't help us in World War II on the beaches of Normandy. Oh, it's not true. I know, but, but nothing you're telling me that they, they actually have to believe that to be okay with it. Well, I, he has cover for that. I mean, yeah, okay. You know, they believe that. They believe wow. anything he says. And, and the result is that he gets away with more. You know, let me add a, a digression for a moment. There was a piece in the Times a couple of days ago uh, for the proposition um, that one of the reasons that Trump had reversed himself on the Doral, uh, you know, hotel issue um, was that the Republicans in Congress were on him about it. And he didn't want to, you know, go head to head with the Republicans. I mean, even Lindsey Graham, who, who manages to walk a fine line and then Walk the other side of the fire. Yeah. <laughs> we used to call that flip flop. <laughs> you got to watch it very carefully. Yeah. We used to call that flip flopping, but that's okay. Anyway, so okay, so they said that the article said that you know this you take this to mean that uh, Trump is Trump is sensitive to the Republican. He want to lose them, and he doesn't want to do stuff that is that is going to alienate them from him. You know because he has an election coming up by, after all and. He's got, a, a He's got a vote coming up. <laughs> well, but it's the Republicans in, the Senate. in Congress. So those are his friends. Yeah. They protect him. They go with him. They like Lindsey Graham. They, you know, they continue to protect him uh, over the long haul or the short haul toward the election. But the one thing that troubles me, and I want to share it with you, really, really troubles me, is this. If he wins the election or stays in office by some sleight of hand or false claim, okay, that means that he's in his last, well, presumably his last term, it means that he doesn't need the Republicans anymore. It's not only a mandate if he wins that election, it's a mandate to do whatever Everybody he wants, wants to do without regard to any constituency, even the Republicans. So he will do the most bizarre things imaginable because there'd be no control at all on him. That's my prediction, if he wins. Yeah. Well, this could not be so. <laughs> This cannot be so. Is he going to get by this uh, this impeachment thing? Of course he's going to get by it, but it's going to be a permanent record, and there will be a trial in the Senate. Uh, obviously, there's going to be a House vote, and it will be affirmative that impeachment needs to move forward. That trial will take place in the Senate, um, and do I think they're actually going to vote him out of office? No, I do not. But it'll be a permanent record in history, and Donald Trump... Only he can spin it to be a positive. That's what he'll do for his loyal 38% base. That this was actually a positive thing that happened. And, you know, he'll spin it any way he can. Because that's what he does. Well, he'll say that it's unfair. He'll say that they a persecution. didn't do constitutional rights, that it's a, a, a witch hunt and all that. And uh, people will agree, and including some of these Republicans, maybe most of these Republicans in the Senate. And, and then you'll have an acquittal. Okay? And with an acquittal... One of the interesting points is, suppose he goes really wild after an acquittal, okay, between an acquittal uh, and the election. Emboldened. Emboldened, okay. Uh, really stuff that absolutely justifies impeachment. Do you think the Congress is going to try a second time? Of course not. Right. It's spent. Done. They, they, they shot their wad. It's all That's it. done. It's pow. It's all pow. So, you know, it's a political thing. They, they couldn't get the votes. They're not going to try again. I mean, even if it's even grosser next time. So I really worry about that, too. They'd better do a good job on this. Now, what happened yesterday was, was interesting, yeah, yeah. with Taylor. Yeah, extremely uh, interesting. I think he, unlike um, the Mueller investigation, he was able to dot the I's, cross the T's, and put context around all his points of testimony and for someone to understand it for a change wasn't convoluted. It was chrono chronologically laid out in very, very succinct terms. I read most of the uh, report, and uh, he did it. He did exactly what, uh, you know, we had ho wished and hoped that Mueller could have done, but he couldn't. Yeah. And he's highly credible with a, a really good career in the military. Oh, he was uh, the 101 Airborne. Yeah. In Vietnam. Yeah. I mean, that's more He's a graduate from West Point. I yeah. mean, this is no slouch. No slouch. And he was a, a career dedicated employee of the government. Right. Didn't have a political affiliation. Right. Um, was hired by George Bush, you know, back in the day. So, I mean. Yeah, great. But they're trying to throw his, you know, throw his name and his character under the bus. Oh, no. Yeah, of course. A guy like that. Yeah, of course they are. Meanwhile, Sunland 
was trying to cover for Trump. There was no quid pro quo and all that. Sutherland, who bought his, uh, his uh, ambassador's seat, um, I, I don't understand how people could be in government with such low credentials and such low moral ethical standards. A couple million uh, dollar camp camp campaign contribution goes a long way. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> I don't see how it, how it happens either, but once you, uh, you know, pay the money down. In this administration, it's happening on a regular basis. I think they call that pay for play. Yeah. Sorts. Well, you know, here's the big thing that one of the things that Taylor did point out, and that was a direct uh, line from Trump to um, McMelvey to the OMB. McElhaney. Yeah, M M Mulvaney, excuse Mulvaney, me. Thank you for, yeah, for that. Yeah. Uh, to the office of uh, the OMB, the Office of Management and Budget. That, that, you know, you just don't have Trump giving orders to people to do his work for him, his bidding. This actually went from Trump uh, right straight to the, uh, a, a direct line to OMB. That's a very significant um, point there. That was the, the money was to withhold and not give out to Ukraine. What Trump military wants assistance. his base to believe is this is not wrong. That if he wants to do this kind of thing, he's the president, he can make a call, he can change the way things work. This is just uh, the new normal, and you reach out and you make the government do whatever you want. And uh, this is okay because uh, the president can do stuff like this. If you can do it, then you're enabled and you do it. That's, that's, that's what he's saying. Yeah, well, we have pretty much four people who have said, okay, either in, in, uh, intentionally or non-intentionally, there is a quid, quid pro quo here. There's four people that have done that. The question is, is it appropriate to do a quid pro quo when it comes to your advantage of political favors and um, using leverage of the United States government that the Congress approved military uh, aid to Ukraine? Remember, Ukraine was being, is still being attacked by Russia. And um, so that's the crux of the argument. Is why, it okay to do it for it? your own political gain? Yeah, and, and ignore Congress. When yeah. Congress appropriated the money, you ignore they Ignore Congress, their directive. And you do it for your own gain. Why does this remind me of the wall? Remember how um, you know, Congress uh, you know, said no wall, we're not the house, and he did which is the money house. Yeah. Uh, the house said no money for that. We're not giving you a wall. And he did it anyway. He did it anyway. He ignored them. Well, he did it anyway by saying, okay, you've... you've, you've Pull the purse strings on me, so I'll declare a national emergency. And in his way, that was the way to open up the purse again and now extract money from the military, uh, Department of Defense, yeah. for funding for the wall. National emergencies that way under proclamation you know, only exist for so long. And I think it's coming up, and he's going to declare it again. Well, the, going to keep it going. both the House and the Senate tried to um, put I'm a kibosh on that. But they couldn't get the vote. Yeah, they couldn't get the vote. They got the votes. They couldn't get the votes to override, override the you. veto. The yeah, veto. Yeah, yeah. So, well, the government's coming apart. You know, that's <clears> the thing. And and if you went back to the time, this is really interesting. If you went back to the time in January of 2017, right after he was elected, and right after he was, uh, you know, inaugurated, um, they had they had riot, not riots, but protests. You know, the women's march in Washington, all that. They, not my president. Remember right. that. Um, and that's sort of died down. Um, but the things that he's done since then have been much, much worse and increasingly worse. And we don't see as many protests. There was a columnist in the Times who recently fatigue. said... Trump huh? fatigue. Trump fatigue. Yeah. And he said, you know, this is, this is the most important moment in American history that we can think of. Um, and the impeachment here is the most important moment to protect the republic. So, uh, and Congress needs, Congress and the Republicans are going to follow what people have to say. And what he said was, get out in the street. This is your big time. You yeah. know, we did the Women's March in January 2017, but now it really matters. Now it's not a question of how many people showed up at the inauguration, how you feel about him on a visceral level. Yeah. It's what he did. And, and Congress is not going to do anything unless we're all out in the street. So let's get on the street. You know everyone in the Senate is literally holding their finger to the, the, the exactly. wind. Exactly. And if they don't hear from their constituents, then it's going to be protection for the president. Hearing. They're not hearing, Tim. Yeah, well, you know, the case has not been laid out yet for the American public. Um, and fortunately, I think Nancy Pelosi finally got it, not to complicate it, not to make this thing so expansive that no one's going to understand it. 
I think it's really clear. And I think they're going to, I think, you didn't think before Thanksgiving. I think they're going to lay this out before Thanksgiving. That's, that's my, my guess. My it. best guess. A they'll vote, in the they'll vote a floor before. Vote in the yes, house. they will do a floor so vote before Thanksgiving. And Thanksgiving is what, three weeks away? Yeah. Months, give them a month. Give them a month. month. Yeah. 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 I think they're going to do it. So time will tell. But, you know, the testimony of Taylor is really, um, this is a really big point of, of this impeachment investigation. And I think they got the right guy in to do it. Yeah. So, um, so how many more people do they need now? I don't know. I don't think they need Rudy Giuliani. I don't think it's worth chasing him around. Chasing him around. Have, you know, on him. Do you think they'll call back Sondland again to see if he actually committed perjury on his time put around? The heat on him. Yeah. yeah. They might call him back in. But, well, these um, guys have refused to testify. Imagine the Secretary of State, the Attorney General, refusing to testify or provide documents, saying it's a witch hunt or whatever that is badly motivated. They're politicizing everything. Well, not to take too far of a left turn, but this one is worth mentioning because um, Trump used the term lynching, that this was a lynching. And did he set the world on fire with that terminology? And um, again, there's a tepid kind of response from the Republicans on this one. Some have stood up tall and said, you know, that's the wrong terminology. Um, but he really has set a lot of people off on, on, on purpose, probably so. He probably selected that word very carefully. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, again, another day for madness well, for the administration. Cycle. I mean, uh, you know, here we are. It's a given Wednesday. And the fact is there'll be more distractions. Um, whatever he does, there'll be a distraction. He, he takes the whole newspaper now, pretty much. Yeah. 80, 90% wow. of the articles are about him. And, um, you know, I think as, as, as you move down away from a bad event, there'll be events that are worse. And so people are distracted from the distractions. I mean, we're in this enormous reality yeah. well, show. Well, it was, you know, just last, last week, we didn't have McMulvey come up there and reverse himself about the quid pro quo. I mean, so we had all these events just in this last seven days. I mean, it's amazing on the, the velocity and the, uh, the amount. And you forget. You and get you confused. Forget. <laughs> well, no, I mean, that's part of the problem. With I got all, the, get all the notes I have in the world, but it's not enough to look, keep us on track. Why don't you look down and give us, uh, give us some more from your notes? Okay, well, let's just talk about a little bit. Um, hey, let's change the subject a little bit. Let's talk about the, uh, the $2 billion sanctions from China. $2.4 billion, actually. Um, interesting stuff, because um, this is actually an ongoing battle that's been going on for quite some time, and that is uh, China saying, hey, um, you know, we want these things removed off our solar panels, our wind, our wind towers, our metal cylinders. We want all those sanctions lifted. So they've, um, they've appealed to the WTO. And the WTO most likely is going to uphold their position on this. No, this how does that fit with our great trade relationship um, with China and how they're going to come to a new understanding and agreement with the United States? I, I think, but the sanctions come from a time before Trump. Yeah, which certainly was. That, that yeah. China hasn't enforced them. Right. So what you get is a, a tone question. What you get is a general mm, statement of the relationship. Wasn't it like two weeks ago that Trump said, don't worry, everybody, we got this one under control. We're negotiating a great deal, a brilliant deal. You're going to love this deal. I'm not going to tell you anything about it, but we're going to, you're going to love this deal. And in, in a few weeks, uh, we'll be able to announce it, and you're going to love it. And then, you know, there was no response from China. They didn't say anything. And saying nothing is really saying, are you kidding? What, what is he talking about? There is no great negotiation going on. There's no great deal. Yeah, what's he talking about? about? And then, and maybe it's kind of a, a continuation of that same statement, you know, don't be fooled. We're, we, we're not making any progress. There is no negotiation going on. As a matter of fact, just to show you how ticked off we are, we're going to levy, a, you know, or seek to impose uh, this $2 billion sanction. Yeah. And I say to myself, that's <clears throat> a message to the world, isn't it? A, that the U.S. deserves to be sanctioned, is what they're saying. And uh, they haven't said that before, you know, they haven't said that yeah. before. Um, and, and, and B, uh, there's no peace talks going on here. So he lied. And in a few weeks' time, and I hope the press catches this, there won't be any revelation. There won't be any announcement about some, you know, huge wraparound settlement with China. On the other hand, Tim, Chinese economy is not doing well. Yeah. And that's probably directly or indirectly a result of Trump's moves. And that... And here's the worst part of it, and that is a harbinger of the possibility of global recession, recession. coming soon. Sure. 
A lot of economists feel that it's coming soon. And he's holding it together with tissue paper. You know, I guess one comment is, is, is Wall Street, i.e. the Dow, um, are they also in a state of denial? Yes, I think so. I, I mean, I mean it's, it's this magic word business, you know, and he's the business president. And he knows business, like how to screw us on the Doral yeah, Hotel. There's some pretty um, savvy analysts out there. And when you see tone in these kind of stories about the $2.4 billion um, you know, protest at WTO, a good analyst would say, hey, you know, maybe things are not going to settle up on this thing. And we've been optimistic in our forecast on, on buy. And um, where are the analysts on this? That's, that's well, my sense of it. And I, I do ask analysts. My sense of it is that, um, you know, if, if you want to bail, not yet. Yeah. This, is, this has got a, a, a couple, three, four, maybe six months to run. But these things are going to catch up. So be, be alert. Uh, because at some point in time, you're going to have to revisit the bail question. Yeah. Um, and when it happens, it's going to be global. Yeah. But there's an old saying. Um, bears, uh, bulls make money, bears make money, and pigs get slaughtered. So you never, <laughs> you never wait to the very end of a cycle to get out. You know, you never begin at the beginning of a, uh, you know, a cycle to get in. Well, I think that's true. So what happens is uh, if you wait a little too long, just a little, okay, too late. You, you know, you lose money. Yeah. Uh, and I think people, people may not, you know, respect that. They may wait a little too long. And then they lose money. And then, of course, the thing is always, you know, it's always, well, it's going down. Um, and maybe it'll go up again. You know, it was up yesterday. I, I'll, I'll, I'll ride with it. And, and uh, I'll hope that it, it, it corrects itself. I mean, it goes up again. And, and it doesn't. And then the next day, you go through the same process. And by the time you look again, you've lost a lot of money. Yeah. Because I think when it goes down, it's going to go down a lot. But, well, you know, Donald Trump puts his... Is basically his administration and his presidency on the buoyancy of the stock market. Well, what a forget, crazy thing to do, but, but that's what market, he does. Trump and the stock market are all about you know, unemployment. Unemployment's low. Yeah. They're all about... Uh, well, you better look at manufacturing numbers of late. Yeah, yeah that's true. And, and, uh, and then you have um, you know, inflation. There's not a lot of inflation. And, uh, and then you have him pushing the Fed around. I, I don't know if that helps. or See, the whole thing is built on public confidence. And he's, he's a confidence man. Yeah. He's a confidence man. So he's, he's playing confidence games with Wall Street and, and with the American public and with the base. So it all holds together. But one of these days, like in every Democrat, one of the legs like of the chair. Yeah. in Louisiana, one of these days, it's going to fall apart. Yeah. And we really have to be very Akamai about that. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Well, I don't know what to tell you about the next week. I can only <laughs> tell you there'll be more distractions. You say that every week. And, uh, well, and, and I'm, I'm you know, wishful thinking that, uh, that the House continues, effectively continues its, uh, its uh, inquiry, and that the Republicans think twice about backing him up, and that the base begins to wake up somehow. I, I, hope, I hope the base listens to our show. Would the base please listen to our show? Would they please listen to CNN and MSNBC once in a while? Well, a couple of the base have listened to the show, and we received comments, uh, you know, reflecting that. <laughs> I don't think they were the most positive comments. Uh, we're not going to okay. tell you on the air what they've said. No, we cannot. <laughs> Thanks, Tim, Jay. Appreciate it very much. Next week. Next week. Can't wait. Yep. Yeah, See you then. Care. Bye. Aloha. Aloha.